Beast Master Sending here. How are you all doing? Hope you're having a great week. Today, I want to tell a story about a Victorian murderer who committed crimes in my hometown, Reading, Amelia Dyer, also known as the Victorian Baby Killer. Possibly one of the most prolific killers of all time. What if I was to ask you to name one Victorian killer? Most of you out there, I'd guarantee, would say Jack the Ripper. However, what if I was to tell you that at exactly the same time, no more than 50 miles away, in a town called Reading, there was a serial killer, more vile, more malicious, and more gruesome than Jack the Ripper. This woman killed seven infants. Jack the Ripper killed five women. These women were known as street walkers, and this was in the late 1800s in Whitechapel in London. This woman that I am about to tell you about is believed to have killed more than the seven that she was convicted of. It's possible her figure could have reached into the hundreds. Join me as we look into Amelia Dyer. Is she the most prolific serial killer ever? This gruesome story starts on March the 30th, 1896, when a bargeman was sailing his cargo down the Thames River near Reading Caversham, just before the lock. He noticed a parcel in the river just near the Clapper's Bridge. He pulled it in with his hook and then took it to the riverbank. This is where the most horrific discovery was made. As he unwrapped the parcel, a small foot was seen under the layers. As he fully opened this parcel, he noticed he had found the corpse of a baby less than one year old. Around her neck, tied twice, was white tape and it was knotted just underneath her left ear. The man quickly ran about a mile into the town centre of Reading, where he went to the headquarters to report this to the police. The police would soon discover that this was the start of a very sinister pattern. When the police looked at this parcel further, they noticed that a name could faintly be seen. It said, Mrs. Thomas, 26, Piggott's Road, Caversham. When they went to the property, it was shortly discovered that Mrs. Thomas had moved on. They spoke to a neighbour who said that Mrs. Thomas was a very respectable woman and that she would not excite any suspicion. Further in their investigation, they went to Reading Station, where the mail clerk there told them that Mrs. Thomas' real name was in fact Amelia Dyer, and told them she has now moved to Kensington Road, off the Oxford Road, just near the Reading Union Workhouse. Before we go any further with the story, I think that it's very important to look into who Amelia Dyer was. Look at her background of how she become the person that she is now so famous for. Amelia Dyer was one of five. She had three brothers and one sister. They lived in a small village 
just outside Bristol called Pile Marsh. She was the daughter of a master shoemaker called Samuel Hobley and mother Sarah Hobley. Amelia was taught to read and write so she was well educated and she was very fond and grew to love literature and poetry. However, Amelia had a horrible, horrible childhood. Her mother suffered from mental illness that was caused by typhus. Amelia would often witness violent outrage and fits due to her mother's mental illness. Amelia was obliged to care for her mother until her passing. Her mother died in 1848. After her mother died, Amelia moved into Bristol to live with an aunt. Shortly after, she started an apprenticeship as a corset maker. When her father died in 1859, her brother Thomas inherited the shoemaker's business. Amelia was estranged from her brothers. Amelia moved back to Bristol into her own lodgings in Trinity Street. While living in Trinity Street, Amelia met a man. His name was George Thomas. Shortly after, she married George. Amelia and George both lied on their wedding certificate. George was 59 and Amelia was only 24. However, Amelia put on her wedding certificate that she was 30. George put that he was 48. This was to shorten the age gap between them. After she married George, Amelia started training as a nurse, where she met a midwife called Ellen Danes. Ellen Danes taught Amelia of an easier way to make money and live your life. Danes told Amelia that she would take in young pregnant women who became pregnant illegitimately. She would then give the baby up for adoption or allow the baby to die of malnutrition or due to neglect. But this was not before charging the mother the privilege of caring for her in her home. Danes had to flee to America shortly after Amelia started training as a nurse due to the authorities became very suspicious of her practice. Now you have to understand what it was like for young women living in the Victorian times in Britain. Unmarried mothers would often struggle financially. This was since the 1834 Poor Law Amendment Act that was passed and this allowed fathers to have no financial obligation to their child if this child was born illegitimately, meaning out of wedlock. Being a single mother was not easy during these times, particularly in a society where you were insulted, looked down upon and ridiculed for being a single mother or for having a child who was illegitimately conceived. Because of society, this is in turn what led to the baby farming practice to start up. Now, ordinary people could become fostering or adoption agents where they would take in the young woman's child for a small fee. Often businesses set up in order to become shelters for young pregnant women to stay while they are waiting for the baby to be born. When the baby was born, it was then passed on to children nurses who they would pay around about five or ten pounds in order for this nurse, I use that lightly, nurse, to take them into their care. Unfortunately, it was quite common practice for some of these 
children's nurses, they would resort to neglecting the child or allowing them to die through malnutrition in order to save money. They would keep the money they were given, allow the children to die. So they did not need to buy the children's clothes, food, or pay for any of the other expenses that one would expect from a child. Often, they would use quite easily to get hold of medicines like Godfrey Cordial that had a high quantity of opium in it. It was said that these children didn't die from overdose of opium like you would expect. However, they died of malnutrition. They were highly sedated and when someone is so highly sedated, they can barely do anything for themselves, let alone eat and drink. And because of this, the children would simply just pass away. This cordial was also nicknamed Mother's Friends. Other cordials were used as well. The other cordials would be high in alcohol contents or opium or any other drug. But these were the more common cordials that were used. Mothers who would choose to come back to reclaim their child or simply just to check up to see how they were doing were often met with quite difficult circumstance. Often they were told they were not allowed to see their child or that the child had moved on. The women never reported this to the authorities due to them still being ashamed of having this child illegitimately. People would then know that they had the child. Also due to fear, not knowing what their friends, their family, their neighbours or the father of the child would think of them. It was because of this fear which allowed these baby farmers to become ever so successful. Now, Amelia Dyer taking on what she had learned from Ellen Danes was the beginning of a very, very dark and gruesome story. Dyer had to leave nursing due to the birth of her daughter, Ellen Thomas. And in 1869, now the quite old George Thomas passed away, leaving Amelia Dyer financially broke and struggling for income. This is how it all started for Amelia Dyer. In order to make an income, she became a children's nurse and started adopting children. However, Amelia Dyer was very eager to become as successful at this as possible. Not only did she take the women in and care for them and then keep their baby for a fee afterwards, she started advertising as a nurse or for adoption for unwanted children to be put in her care for a fee. She would often charge these women between five and 10 pounds, sometimes higher depending on their class. This all depended on how much they wanted to keep this pregnancy a secret. These women would have these children disappear for a little while, give birth, give the child over to a person like Amelia Dyer, and then get back to normal with their life. No one ever knowing that they were pregnant. Going back to work. Just carrying on as if, as if nothing happened. However, many of them did try to reclaim their children. After they become better off financially. In 1872, Amelia Dyer married again. This time to a man called William Dyer. Who was a brewer's labourer from Bristol. They had two children together, a girl they called Marianne, who was also known as Polly, and a son whose name was William Samuel. It's not sure why, but eventually Amelia decided to leave her husband with both of her children. At some point in Amelia's baby farming career, she decided that to rather let them 
die of neglect and starvation, she would start just killing them in order to save money. You would also need to pay for the the medicines that were used to sedate these children. She wasn't prepared to spend any bit of the money that was given to her to show any sort of care or mercy for these children. Eventually, I'm glad to say, Amelia Dyer was caught after the local doctor became very concerned about the amount of children's death in Amelia's care. However, instead of being convicted of murder or at least manslaughter, she was only sentenced to six months hard labor. This apparently had quite a ill effect on Amelia's mental health. But some would argue during this time that the leniency shown to Amelia was far less than that was shown for someone whose crime was considered a lot more less than the one Amelia had committed. After her release, Amelia tried to go back into nursing, but a short while after starting back into it, her mental health started to deteriorate to a point that she was actually sent to a mental hospital. However, people would say that it was very coincidental that this would happen when Amelia felt that she needed to disappear for a while. It was said that Amelia being a former asylum nurse herself, that she knew how to work the system. She knew how to get on and have quite a comfortable life inside there. And when she had had enough and wanted to leave, she knew how to act in order to convince them that she was now better. It is also believed that the mental health issues that Amelia experienced wasn't due to the hard labor that she was sentenced to, that in fact it was years and years of abuse of alcohol and opium based drugs that she started taking quite early into her baby farming career. In 1890, Amelia started caring for an illegitimate child of a very wealthy and popular governess. However, the governess quickly became suspicious of Amelia. When she went back to visit her child, she demanded that Amelia handed her the baby. The governess then stripped down the child. She told Amelia she was looking for a birthmark on one of the child's hips. When she stripped the child down and checked the hips, she did not find the birthmark. Due to this and rising suspicions from the authorities, Amelia decided to try and take her life. She downed two bottles of Laundrum, which is a high strength opium medicine. Due to her years of abuse of opium drugs, she had actually built up a tolerance to opium and so the amounts that would have killed another person did not kill Amelia. Amelia Elizabeth Dyer, who was also known as Annie, had many aliases. She arrived in Caversham in 1895 with her daughter Marianne, also known as Polly, and then son-in-law Arthur Ernest Palmer. On January 1896, a young popular barmaid named Evelina Marmon became pregnant illegitimately. She gave birth to a baby girl who she named Doris Marmon. Evelina quickly looked to get rid of the child, so she put a advertisement in her local newspaper, the Bristol and Mirror Times. When she was going back and looking over her ad once it was published, coincidentally next to hers was another ad. It was from a lady called Mrs. Harding, which simply read, and I will just read this out to you. 
Married couple with no family would adopt healthy child, nice country home, terms £10. Marmon responded to the advertisement and wrote to Mrs Hardin, expressing that she was interested in her services. A few days later, Marmon received a letter back from Mrs Harding. The letter was stamped from Oxford Road, Reading. This letter read, and I will just read it out again. I should be glad to have a dear little girl, one I can bring up and call my own. She then went on to say, We are plain, homely people in very good circumstance. I don't want a child for money's sake, but for home comforts. And myself and my husband are dearly fond of children. We have no children of our own. A child with me will have a good home and a mother's love. Evelina wanted to pay a more affordable weekly amount. However, Mrs. Harding demanded that the £10 should be paid in full. Evelina being in such dire straits reluctantly had no choice but to accept Mrs. Harding's terms. A week later they met up at Cheltenham train station. Evelina later reported saying that she was very surprised at the appearance of Mrs. Harding. She expected her to be younger, wealthy looking. However this wasn't actually Mrs. Harding who showed up. It was in fact Amelia Dyer just using another one of her aliases. Evelina Marmon handed over her daughter a box of clothes and £10. She didn't know then but this would be the last time that Evelina would see her little girl alive. Once Dyer had the child she promised Evelina that she would be returning straight to Reading. However, she did not return straight to Reading. She took a detour by train to London, where she went to a property at Mayo Road in Williston. There she met her daughter, Polly. She quickly got round to locating some white edging tape and wrapped it twice around Doris's neck and tied a knot just under her left ear. Apparently, death was instantaneous. Dyer is later quoted in saying that she loved to watch the children with tape around their neck. However, it was over too quickly for her. Both allegedly, Polly and Amelia wrapped the child in wet napkins. They then stuffed it into a carpet bag. They kept some of the clothing, but most of it was destined for the pawnbrokers. They also gave a pair of Doris's boots, her little booties, to the landlady when they went to pay the rent for the house at Mayo Road. They gave her the booties for her own young daughter. The following day, Wednesday the 1st of April 1896, Amelia brought another young child to Mayo Road. His name was Henry Simmons. She could not locate any more edging tape. So instead, she unwrapped the edging tape from around Doris's neck and used this to strangulize Henry until he died. Henry's body, along with Doris, were both put into a red carpet bag, including bricks in order to weigh it down. Henry was only 13 months old. On the 2nd of April, Amelia took the bag with both bodies in it, believed by train 48 miles back to Reading, where she went to the Clappers Bridge in Caversham, just outside the Reading town, and she forced the bag through the wooden railings into the Thames River below. So let's go back to when the police first realised that Mrs Thompson was in fact Amelia Dyer. The police 
even though they had their suspicions, did not have enough evidence to arrest Amelia in connection with the crime. However, they did ask around and tried to find out more about Amelia Dyer. They spoke to neighbours. They also spoke to Bristol police. And after speaking to them, became even more concerned that Amelia Dyer is guilty. But this still wasn't enough evidence to arrest her. So the police decided to get a young woman to contact Amelia and tell her that she was interested in her services. Now, people believe that this was done for two reasons. One, to show that Amelia was in the baby farming career. And two, to pinpoint Amelia's location. They couldn't just show up at the property. They also couldn't question her too much. Knowing that she was a suspect, the police knew that Amelia, like she had done before, would just up and leave and disappear and they would lose her forever. Amelia agreed to meet the young woman who the police was using as a decoy. They arranged a time to meet up and the woman was to attend Amelia's house. Amelia was sat there and she heard a knock at the door expecting it to be the woman. When she answered, she was greeted by two police officers. One, DC Anderson, and the other, Sergeant James. On the 3rd of April, which was also a Good Friday, the police raided Amelia's Kensington Road home. The police reported a strong foul stench of death in that house. However, nobody was found. They did, however, find loads of baby clothing. They also found letters from mothers writing to their babies and they found vaccination certificates. The police also calculated that a Mrs. Thomas in just the last few months would have, have adopted 20 babies and children. However, there seemed to be only two under her care at that present time. It was also quite clear to the police that she was packing up and ready to move. They saw evidence that she was planning on moving to Somerset. In the home, police also found pawn tickets for baby clothing and in Amelia's sewing basket they also found white edging tape that matched the same tape that was found on the baby that was pulled out of the Thames River. The police now had enough evidence and on the 4th of April 1896 Amelia was arrested. She was taken down to the police station where she was shown the parcel. Amelia admitted knowing the parcel, saying she recognised it. However, she was not aware of the contents and that it was a mystery for her. Both Amelia's daughter, Polly, and son-in-law, Arthur Palmer, were both arrested for accessory in Amelia's crime. Also, that same week of Amelia's arrest, a thorough search was done around the lock and the Clapper Bridge in Caversham, Reading, where they located six further bodies, making the death toll to now seven. The police only managed to identify three of them corpses, one being Doris Marmon, Henry Simmons, and Helena Frey. Doris was only a few weeks old. Henry, 13 months. And it is unsure how old Helena Frey was. However, it is believed that she was around about six months or less. 11 days after the barmaid, Elevina Marmon, 
handed her child over to Amelia Doris. She was now in Reading identifying the corpse of her young daughter's remains. An inquest in early May and decided that Mary Ann, aka Polly, and Arthur Palmer, that there was no evidence to suggest that they were an accessory to Amelia Dyer's crime. Arthur was discharged as a result of this, and also Amelia, in her own hand, wrote a confession letter explaining how both her daughter and her son-in-law were not involved and were unaware of Amelia's goings on. On the, 20, on the 22nd of May, 1896, Amelia Dyer appeared before the Old Bailey. She pleaded guilty to the murder of Helena Frey, the first little child that was found in the Thames River. Her only defense was insanity. However, the prosecutor rightly said that your mental illness coincides with when you fear that you may be discovered for your crimes. It took the jury just four and a half minutes to find Amelia Dyer guilty of the other six murders, putting the total to seven. She was sentenced to die by hanging at Newgate Prison. Dyer was hanged by executioner James Billington at Newgate Prison on Wednesday the 10th of June 1896, precisely at 9am. Newspapers reported afterwards, death was apparently instantaneous and was infinitively more merciful than the strangulation that Dyer liked to practice on her victims. The only traces left after this in Kavisham of these forgotten children were crosses carved into the clapper's wooden posts. However, this bridge has now been replaced by a more modern steel bridge, so these crosses no longer exist. After Amelia Dyer's death, a popular ballad was created about her, called Ogress of Reading. Adoption laws were also made stricter, where it gave the authority more policing over them. But this and the scrutinising of newspapers who were helping run these advertisements did not stop the baby farming, did not stop the abuse. Just two years after Amelia Dyer's death, railway workers at Newton Abbott train station discovered a three week old baby girl. Even though she was wet and cold, she was still alive and survived. Jane Hill told the police that she sold her baby girl to a Mrs. Stewart for £12 at Plymouth station. It is then thought that Mrs. Stewart dumped the little girl on the first train she could. Just so happens this train was stopping at Newton Abbott. It was also claimed that Mrs. Stewart was in fact Polly, Amelia Dyer's daughter who escaped execution herself. It is uncertain how many babies and children died at the hands of Amelia Dyer. However, due to her practice lasting 30 years, 
due to the amount of clothing that was found, due to the letters, the vaccination certificates, and also other reports and suspicions throughout her life, it is estimated that the death toll is in the hundreds. Some even saying as much as 400. While researching Amelia Dyer, I found out something that I found, um, I found quite interesting, let's just say. Because Amelia Dyer was a murderer around the same time as Jack the Ripper, it has led some to believe that Amelia Dyer is Jack the Ripper. They reckon that it happened due to botched abortions that Amelia may have carried out for the prostitutes. Now obviously during this time, a prostitute didn't have access to a prostitute didn't have access to contraception. They also ne didn't really have the finances in order to seek medical help. That um, they would have people perform abortions on them. Now, as Amelia Dyer was trained as a nurse and a midwife, it is understanding that she is quite familiar with abortions herself. And there we have it, possibly Britain's or even the world's most prolific serial killer. Definitely one of the more horrendous and gruesome serial killers. How being a nurse, a midwife, could you possibly take the life of a small child that has been put under your care? The trust the mother must have had for Amelia Dyer just shows how wicked and cruel and misleading Amelia Dyer really was. Now I wanted to tell this story because firstly it's a true story. I've walked along that bridge. Now the bridge looks somewhat different now. It is not the same rickety wooden bridge it would have been in Amelia Dyer's time. Um, it's a lot more stable. It's a metal bridge now that's stretched right across above the uh, the lock in Caversham in Thames in the Thames River. However, I have heard this story a lot growing up, and I wanted to look into it. I was born in Reading. I lived in Reading for most of my life. I only moved away around about four years ago to Cornwall. Now what interests me the most about this story is it stretched all the way from Reading all the way through to Plymouth and Newton Abbott which Newton Abbott and Plymouth if you're not aware is bordering right onto Cornwall. It just fascinated me how Amelia Dyer and her daughter committed their crimes. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed this story, um, I hope you don't have nightmares, but please guys, if you enjoyed this and you want to see more stories, I love telling stories, I really enjoy it, but if you want to see more of this, please give me a big thumbs up, subscribe, leave some comments below, and ding that little bell, ding it, and you'll be ready for when I upload, you'll get that notification coming through. Anyway, guys, as always, take care of yourself, and I will see you all soon. Bye.